How are you guys doing? My name's Daniel. I'm here to talk about Spark 3.5. Hope you guys are doing. Hope you guys are doing well, having a good time um, in the conference, learning a lot, learning a lot about data and AI and everything in between. Cool. So yeah, my name is Daniel. I work on Apache Spark at Databricks, um, and I'm here to talk about specifically Apache Spark 3.5 release. I think there's a separate there's a separate talk about Spark 4.0, and I'm going to try my best to constrain this talk about what's in 3.5. It's a nice, stable release. Um, so let me jump right into it. Cool. So um, yeah, Apache Spark's been around. Um, data management ETL project been around for over 10 years. Um, it's got a lot of impact, a lot of collaboration, a lot of impact from people around the world. Um, so we're definitely super grateful for everyone um, collaboration work effort, both in using Spark and contributing to it, so thank you. Yeah, so some, um, some fun numbers. Um, Spark's been downloaded over a billion times, as it turns out. Um, there's been over 100,000 questions asked about it on Stack Overflow, which have now been indexed by every LLM out there. Uh, <laughs> over 3,000 GitHub contributors, hundreds and hundreds of data sources, so Spark, the core code base has a handful of built-in data sources, but there's hundreds and hundreds of connectors out there um, that people have built to integrate Spark with pretty much anything. Um, so it's pretty awesome. Um, yeah, and I'm proud to kind of announce that one, once again, Spark is the number one developer activity over a bunch of kind of other projects in, in this domain. Um, don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to dunk on any of these other open source projects. They're awesome. I love Flink. It's my favorite thing sometimes. But Spark is still number one um, with over 40,000 commits, lots of contributors, um, ton, tons, of, tons of love. So that's, that's great. Yeah, so uh, Apache Spark came out of uh, UC Berkeley as a, kind of as a research project and it kind of grew from there, um, as, as you well know. So that's kind of its origins, academic origins, and then kind of built, the original idea was to solve problems and make breaking down data easier for everyone, and it's kind of still its, its main purpose, right? So yeah, um, I'll go over a number of features. Um, this is kind of like a whirlwind breakdown diagram of everything that we're gonna go over. Um, so I'll break, break it down, it's four main categories. Um, I'll start with Spark Connect briefly, um, explain it if uh, for those folks who haven't listened about Spark Connect recently or aren't familiar with what it is. Talk about SQL. Um, I've been working on SQL for 12 plus years um, in the industry, so I kind of, it's kind of my thing. And then I'll talk about Python um, and then streaming at the end. Yeah, so let's jump into it. So I'll start with Spark Connect, right? So this is a pretty exciting area. Um, so what is Spark Connect? What, why do we care, right? So um, the problem that Spark Connect is trying to solve is that prior to Spark Connect, you run a Spark program, like a Scala program or a Python program, on some server, on some process, right? This process becomes the driver, right? So um, there's code executing in your Scala program, whatever, and then it says, all right, um, create a data frame and call dot collect on it. So I'm gonna go, you know, turn into the driver and schedule everything out. You know, easy to embed, but problem is, um, if you run a cluster of this stuff and you want to upgrade it, switch Spark versions, take advantage of the wonderful features that I'm about to go over, 3.5, for example. But you have a bunch of programs that are, you know, using Scala 2.12, whatever old Scala version or old you know, Python version. You don't want to deal with upgrading it. Well, now you have to upgrade all your pipelines, right? Um, so that's kind of kind of a uh, like a pain point there. So the idea is. Uh, Spark Connect kind of frees you from that capability, and it gives you kind of the ability to write your um, Spark programs with a thin client. So the client is kind of super small and compiles in, and you can write your data frames and your programs, and then they compile into uh, protocol buffers, right? So they serialize into this, this protocol that goes from your client, which can be anything, right? It can be a laptop, or it could be like a tablet or any edge device. 
and then it goes over the wire somewhere to your Spark cluster which is running elsewhere. So you can upgrade your Spark cluster independently of the, um, of the edge device or whatever is running your Spark Connect programs. And this also kind of gives you the ability to make many different clients. So, so you can make many language clients for Spark that don't need a JVM. Right? You don't need to ship a JVM anymore. Right? So you can make a Golang client. Um, you can make a Rust, you know, there's a Rust Spark client in development, and this is super um, easy and kind of manageable for the community, right? Because you don't have to have, build your own integration into the JVM like Pi4j, or, but extrapolate to every single language, right? So it's a lot easier. Um, and it kind of integrates more easily. Uh, you can use your IDE, your favorite IDE to develop against your live Spark cluster. So there's lots of cool things you can do. So what's new in 3.5 with Spark Connect, right? So um, lots of things. Um, kind of in earlier versions of Spark, um, Spark Connect got kind of more love of the Python client first, right? So uh, PySpark programs worked well earlier on. In 3.5, the Scala client comes and ca kind of catches up, right? So those of you who use Scala a lot, um, you'll be happy to hear this, right? So this involved a lot of refactoring ripping apart the SQL module and like parts of the engine to make it compatible to kind of rip apart the stuff we needed for the client. Take it out, um, put it in a separate module. So now when you install the client, it's like, it's not like 300 megabytes dependency anymore, right? All right, so for example, you can use mllib directly. Um, you can do logistic regression, basic model evaluation, stuff like that. Um, and integrate nicely with Spark's vectorized Python UDFs a framework. So lots of cool things. Tons and tons of work went into this. Um, lots of just like adding client, Scala client uh, endpoints and, and uh, functions, but also kind of ripping apart the, you know, the engine itself to kind of separate this giant SQL um, module into to pieces that are more easily do, easy to embed in the client. Cool. Right, so other things, um, Pandas API is improved. Uh, there's better parity for that. And uh, you know, the client for structured streaming workloads now supports everything, right? So there was some features missing before. Right, so as I mentioned, there's now a Go client. It's a separate project. Um, feel free to check it out. This is, uh, this is possible because you don't need to bring a JVM anymore. And you can now run Pandas functions and logic uh, more easily, right? Cool. Okay, so let me uh, jump into SQL, right? So th that's kind of infrastructure stuff, Spark Connect. Now let me go into some, uh, some new features, right? So there's kind of four main categories here, right? Um, first one, this is kind of one of my favorites, is called the identifier clause. And so this is a new SQL feature where you can kind of protect yourself against SQL injection attacks. It's like the number one vulnerability type out there. Um, so this is kind of like a, the next generation of uh, regular query parameters, which is like the first line of defense that uh, folks recommend against SQL injections. But the this works for table names and column names and other identifiers in the SQL query, right? So this is what it looks like. You can run a SQL command of some kind, and then wherever an identifier can appear, you put this identifier keyword, parentheses, and then a reference to the identifier, um, and then you provide the identifier uh, keys and values as a map out of line. All right, so instead of, prior to this, you might do like a Scala string interpolation, put like dollars table name, and then table name is a string that gets like substituted in, which is awesome until that string is uh, T semicolon drop table something, and then you run it, and then you, you give SQL injection, right? So you don't have to deal with that anymore. So this is another example of how it works in more places. So there's an identifier for the select um, item, the column there, and then an identifier for uh, the table name. Cool. All right, so next feature. Um, I, I personally worked on this. Uh, so the named argument syntax for function calls, right? So for SQL functions, you can call them um, with this uh, syntax, which is kind of similar to Python, where 
You can provide the arguments uh, with their names preceding their values, and they can be in any, any order, right? So this is in the SQL standard, the NCSQL SQL standard. Um, so uh, it's, it's, it's really nice because when you have functions like this where there's a lot of different arguments, you can name them, and then it's more readable. You see what the function call is doing by reading it. Um, and it also makes it more easy to extend um, SQL language, right? Because you can add these, uh, these parameters and have defaults, right? So you can add new parameters later with defaults, which doesn't break any existing function calls, right? You can add a new parameter with a default, default to null or empty, some empty value, and then um, consume it. Right, so that's kind of like a nice backwards compatibility feature. Cool. All right, so next one um, this is kind of useful. So uh, Spark is integrated hyper log log approximate aggregates functions into the engine, right? And this is kind of uh, third party plugins used to uh, kind of also work, provide this functionality, but it's now built in the engine where you can use um, SQL functions to do approximate counts of distinct values, um, but store the intermediate results in these sketch buffers, right? and then write them to storage. Um, so what this means is you can have like daily pipelines or ETL jobs or something that will compute approximate counts of something, store the incremental results in the buffers, and then the next day you do it again, and you can update the previous one. So you can compute this like running accumulation and then at any time, when you want to get the value out, you just call this uh, estimate scalar function on, right? So this is kind of what it looks like. You have a values list or some source table. You call um, HLL sketch ag, which is the aggregate function, consumes the inputs, produces the sketch buffer. And then here we uh, call this HLL sketch estimate um, scalar function on the buffer to give you the approximate count. Right, so this is, uh, this, is, this is the Apache Data Sketches library, which is another pro Apache project. Um, so there's interop uh, here if you want to use other software to um, produce or consume the sketches, right? So it's like an open format, already existed for a, for a while. Uh, this library is a lot of features, it's pretty awesome, right? Cool. And then the last, um, last salient new SQL feature um, to mention here is uh, like a library of uh, SQL functions to manipulate arrays, right? So um, the array type is a SQL standard uh, construct and it lets you represent multiple values in a single field, right? So you can have an array type column and have each, each value in each row of that column can have an array inside, which is useful if you want to keep your relational schema reasonable, right? You don't need to like duplicate your values just to have repeating elements of something. And uh, now there's a lot more functions to kind of do stuff with arrays, right? So you can add new values to the beginning or the end. You can insert into the middle. You can compact the nulls out, things like that. Cool. So, um, and so in addition to the new features, um, we kind of, the community kind of put a lot of effort into building out parity between C, the SQL language stuff and the Scala API, data frame API, Python and R data frame APIs, so that if you prefer data frames, you can do all the same stuff, right? So this was, there was kind of some disparity before and it was frustrating to people who'd Google around and find like an example and it uses SQL and it's awesome. They prefer data frames and uh, doesn't work, right? So um, there's a lot of new functions that have been ported over so that it just works the same, um, right? So this is kind of an example, right? So use your data frames. This Unix micros function is now available as one, as one of many examples. Um, so um, it's kind of good for the community, right? So, this is a gratuitous screenshot. There's lots and lots of people who worked on this. Thank you, everyone, for working on little bits of this here and there. Cool. Okay, so um, move on to the Python features, right? So um, Python is definitely a first-class citizen of Apache Spark with the introduction of PySpark. 
Um, and especially now with uh, Spark's heavy use in the data science community and in the artificial intelligence and machine learning community. Um, so it's important. So we're community is kind of putting a lot of effort here. Um, cool. So what fun new stuff do we have in Spark 3.5 with Python? Um, we have uh, vectorized Python UDFs is one nice thing where um, you can use vectorized I.O. and use the Apache Arrow format to send data to and from the Python subprocess, right? All right, so you can do this um, with a Spark config. Set your Arrow enabled Spark config. All your UDFs will use Apache Arrow, get some nice speed ups, or you can do it on a per function uh, basis like this, right? So you can do it at registration time. If you don't, if you have this giant library of PySpark UDFs and you just want to like try a new one and you want to be careful about it. All right, so this is awesome. Uh, it makes your functions faster. Um, and the speed ups kind of really shine when you have like huge data sets, lar large, uh, large values, um, and they can really crank on it. Uh, so th this is great. Cool. Okay, so um, next I'd like to introduce a new feature that um, is kind of a, like a passion project for me personally, um, but there's also been some coverage of this. Um, I think there's a dedicated talk about Python UDTFs um, elsewhere in, in this conference, and it's also kind of covered in the Spark 4 uh, talk, but I'll, I'll go over it here as well, right? So, so this is a new, new Python feature, and it's a new type of UDF where the, the user-defined table function, can sh it's a UDF that appears in the from clause of a SQL query um, and returns a table instead of a scalar value. Right? So, um, um, and by the same token, if you prefer data frames, then you can use the data frame syntax right? so that, to call them, right? So what, you know, what does this look like? Here's what it looks like, right? So you can register one of these um, you basically create a class and uh, register it with this decorator. And in this example, we, uh, we're creating a UDTF and defining an output schema. It's kind of a static schema, right? So you have two columns. Uh, they're both integer type. And then this eval method runs, consumes the input arguments, right? And then yields zero or more output rows with just a regular Python yield syntax. This is kind of what the function looks like. So what does it look like when we're calling, calling these things, right? So here's an example. We'll call it a SQL query, provide uh, the two arguments, this case uh, just integers, and a table comes out, right? So your Python can give you a whole table. And uh, here's the corresponding data frame syntax. But I put a second not because I love SQL more just because I flipped the coin, it's just like data frame SQL, right? So that's the data frame syntax. Um, cool, so that's the, this is kind of the, up till now is like what's available in 3.5 explicitly. Um, I'll give a sneak peek into kind of more features of UDTFs because we continue working on these after the 3.5 release, which was like a nice tight six month release window. So it's like on time and the development continued. So. Um, some more features in the UDTF library available in Spark 4 as a big thing called polymorphic analysis. And what this means is, um, if you recall earlier, um, compute the schema, the UDTF, we kind of statically defined it, right? So it says two integers come, all columns come out, period, right? Um, with polymorphic analysis, the function can actually compute its own schema every time depending on the provided arguments. It's kind of uh, what the code might look like, right? So you define this analyze method, takes the arguments, and including the, the, the types of the provided arguments and the schemas of a provided input table, if any. And if, if they're uh, constant uh, scalars, the actual values, right? So this file name can actually be a string. You actually look at the string and uh, use, its, use its value to compute the schema, right? So um, this is useful, for example, for things like taking a file name or a path or a glob or something, and then doing some API lookup, seeing what's inside, 
right? You can imagine like a CSV file name or an XML file name or something. Open the file, see, oh, this is the contents. I'm gonna give a schema that reflects that data, right? Return that. So it can be different every time. Cool. So, yeah, and uh, so I mentioned taking an input table as an argument. This is another kind of new part of, part of this feature, right? So um, the idea is you can take an input table argument um, if the UDTF wants to, and the eval method will receive uh, an instance of this PySpark row um, object, right? So that means eval method got called once for every row of the input table. So if there's a million rows, it gets called a million times on the same instance of the class. And then at the end, this terminate method gets called. So the function can do initialization in the init method of the class. Eval gets called, computes its information. It can yield rows here or not, right? Store any state it wants in the class field. And then in terminate method at the end, it can yield rows at the end if it wants to, right? So it can consume the whole input table do something, and then return an output table. So for example, uh, you could imagine one of these, uh, making one of these for like a machine learning training uh, function where you consume all million rows, send them off to like a TensorFlow job or whatever MLflow job, runs for an hour, gives you back the result. You open up the result in the terminate method and give the answer out. Right, or give a summary saying like I did what you wanted. Right, and so um, when you're passing input tables like this, the query lets you kind of decide how to split it up, right? So you can say, I want all million rows of the table to go to the same class, because it needs to know everything, or I can support parallelism, right? Because if you, if you do that, it has to go to one Spark task and kind of gets bottlenecked. If you want to run this on really big data and speed it up, you can define a partitioning of the input table, which means um, that you give these one or more expressions, right, like ID divided by 10. And what this means is each combination, each unique combination of values of these partitioning expressions, all the rows of that combination of values will go to the same class instance. Right, so if you take the ID column divided by 10, a bunch of those rows are gonna have the result of zero. Some of them are gonna have the result of one. All those are gonna be grouped together. Right? So it's, this is common um, using like a date as a partitioning key or you know, like a, sh a mod, mod of a, like some large ID or something like that. Right, so you can kind of paralyze it the way you want. And you can also pass, um, Variable length, or, uh, variable argument lists, right? So using Python star args or star kw args syntax, right? Where um, if you want, the function can accept anything and you can, the query can call it, pass whatever, right? It can pass nothing, empty parentheses, or it can pass a, like some strings, or it can pass a table um, and the function will accept it. And then this code can decide what to do. Right, so if you pass SQL named arguments, like we talked about earlier, the names will be in the KW args keys, and then it can inspect them and see what to do. Or it can return an error saying like, I don't know what this argument is that you passed me, try again, right? Or this argument you passed me is out of the valid range, so you know, here's, here's you know, how it's supposed to work. Cool. So this is kind of what that looks like. You pass in whatever argument values and then this, the code can look at them and decide what to do. So this can be very, very kind of general, reusable functionality where um, you write it once and then you kind of like can work in a variety of different ways. And finally, um, it's also possible to do custom initialization um, up front. We put this in the analyze method and right, so the analyze method here. You can also create a subclass of the, and this analyze results is the results of analysis containing the schema. You can create a subclass of this, put whatever you want, right? So you can also, in addition to the table output schema, you can put anything, your initialization, right? And then that'll just get passed, pickled and passed along to the init method 
of every instance, right? So if you get partition the input table, you have a thousand partitions or whatever, you'll create a thousand instances of this class later, init method runs and it gets your analyze result subclass, right? So you can do one-time initialization that's slow or expensive and reuse it. Right, so this is kind of what that looks like. You're gonna, your analyze method will compute the output schema and also compute a bunch of other stuff, right? So you can put other, other information in here. Cool. So that's UDTFs, um, very general. Um, other fun Python features that um, the community has added. Um, we've kind of moved the error handling behavior of PySpark to this error class framework. So um, to use canonical error codes, um, right? So that means uh, there's good documentation for what the errors mean. Um, it's easy to look them up. Um, you don't have like weird exceptions that you don't expect. It's just a nicely formatted error code. Um, and it's kind of like a description of what the error is. So um, there's been a lot of work there, um, a lot of different places. This makes it a lot easier to kind of manage a big cluster that you know, can have problems and kind of categorize types of errors that might happen. It might be flaky ones, transient errors, and there might be kind of really unexpected ones that you want to know about. Cool. And then um, another fun, fun Python feature for testing. Um, if you want to test your Python, which is a good idea, as some folks say, no one tests their SQL queries. But if you test your Python, it's a good idea because it's a dynamically typed language. You don't know what's going to happen. So you got to test it. Um, it's easier to do that now um, with this data frame equality testing API, which um, Kind of, it's kind of like a step beyond just comparing data frames to each other and seeing if they match, right? So this is kind of these new APIs. Whereas before, you might do some, compute some data frame and then you have the expected result. They say, assert that they're equal. The test says, fail, they're not equal. And you get false. And you're just like, okay, this is annoying, right? So now, um, this, this testing framework kind of gives you some more um, debugging, some more debugging information, right? So um, if they don't match, maybe there's only one row that's different, right? Um, but the rest, of the, the rest of the data frame is the same. This will print out the rows that are, the one row that's different, highlight it. Um, it'll tell you the one value, it's easy to see that the one value is different. And so it's a lot easier to move, move on with your work, right? Um, or maybe the entire data frame is completely different and this, the results do not match. It'll be like a very, very low percentage and then it'll do its best to kind of tell you. But uh, we find much of the time when the data frames don't match, it's only like a tiny part that's different. Right? So this will just tell you. Cool. And then um, finally, there's a deep speed distributor um, integration with PySpark. So, um, this makes it easier to use Spark um, to run deep speed distributed training and inference. It's kind of a nice integration there. Cool. All right, so that's the Python. Um, and finally, I'll uh, kind of touch on this streaming, Spark streaming improvements that are in 3.5. Wrap it up, right? So there's kind of four, four main improvements and I'll kind of go over them one by one. So the, the, most, you know, the most interesting one is probably full support for multiple stateful operators, right? So you can now just compose your streaming queries and have like whatever operators you want. Um, for example, you can have a time interval join between two streams and then aggregate after. Couldn't do that before, right? You get a weird error message saying, um, I think it pretty much says you can't have multiple stateful operators in a stream so don't do that, right? <laughs> this is super unactionable and annoying. Um, and uh, this actually does come up a lot in use cases, like joining st streams of ads and clicks, um, and then you can aggregate over the result, right? So here's kind of what that looks like with Python. And then here's kind of what the Scala version of it would look like. Cool. Um, yeah. So. 
Next kind of interesting streaming improvement um, is change log checkpointing for RocksDB state store providers, right? So you can persist the check the the checkpoint. These you can checkpoint the change log updates of the state in RocksDB. Um, so um, this will help reduce your commit latency a lot, and your total your total latency along with that. So you set this config, and then you checkpoint into RocksDB, and something flakes out in your stream. You can use the checkpoint um, and uh, take advantage of that. So this is kind of like nice integration. So here's that kind of configs that you're going to want to use for that. Cool. And uh, along those lines, right? So if you use RocksDB state store, um, it, uh, it's now possible to kind of config the memory management for all of the RocksDB's instances in the executor kind of holistically, right? So um, whereas before you could kind of do it on a one by one basis, say like each instance has a memory max, kind of plan for the worst case and the median case. Uh, scenarios for the memory usage and and, uh, and reason about like what your container memory total memory is or the process total memory is. Now you can just set one max for all of the instances and uh, it'll just take care of it for you. So it's, a, it's just an easier easier configuration for you. Cool. Um, there's also uh, this new API called Drop Duplicates within Watermark. Right? So um, with this streaming API, it will deduplicate events within your stream, within the watermark that you specify, but the timestamp doesn't have to be the same exactly, right? They can be close, um, but they don't have to be identical, right? So, you know, again, without this, before this feature, you got weird errors like timestamps for event time could differ even though the events would otherwise be considered as duplicates, like thanks, Spark, I knew that. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to get this error message. I just want to dedupe the things that I want to dedupe, so um, you can now tell it what to do, right? Um, given a watermark, uh, like ten hours in this example, and uh, it'll take care of it for you. Cool. Yeah. So that's uh, the end of the talk. The end of the the new features that I've got to describe for you. So thanks everyone. I want to thank you for contributing to Spark, using Spark, uh, making it great, being invested, being involved. Um, it's definitely needs, needs a community to make it great. So uh, thank you. Thank you all for uh, contributing. <laughs>